Please be seated. It is now our memory verse time. So if you'll take your Bibles, it's the first Sunday of the month. So this Sunday, we get to read it three times, and we get to look every time. We, and, uh, no pressure this week. This week, we don't need to worry about whether or not we know it yet. But Galatians chapter 2, verse 20 is our memory verse this month. You probably already have memorized it at some point in your Christian life. And so for some, it might just be a refresher. And for some, it might be brand new. So I will learn it all together this month. Galatians chapter 2, verse 20. And uh, when you find it, we will read it through three times together. <clears throat> Galatians 2.20. You ready? I don't hear anybody else saying Galatians 2.20 with me. All right, Miss Mary in the front row. <laughs> Galatians 2.20, I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me, and the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. I think it's a longer memory verse than we normally do, but it should be a familiar verse, so I'm banking on that, making it so that a lot of people have it memorized by the end of the month. Now let's do it again. Galatians 2.20. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. And one more time, Galatians 2.20, I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. All right. I don't think we'll have any problems with that. <laughs> It's a, it's a good verse. Uh, for your announcements tonight, um, remember that on Tuesday night is tracking at 7 o'clock. I won't be able to be there this week, but Brother Wayne and Brother Chun Tang are both going to be there. So if you'd like to go tracking uh, with, with them, uh, Tuesday night at 7 o'clock. And um, trust that we'll see a good number of tracks passed out that night. Um, then on Wednesday night is prayer meeting. On Wednesday night, um, we are going to be starting a new series on Wednesday night. Uh, the, sh the shadow of, I don't know what I said this morning, but the shadow of the cross. That's, I think, a better title than what I had this morning. What did I say this morning? The shadow of good things to come. Too wordy. The shadow of the cross, we'll say. We're looking at uh, the Old Testament sacrifices and the Old Testament feasts, which Hebrews tells us is a shadow of good things to come. And so uh, we are going to be considering those starting on Wednesday night, so I trust that you'll be able to join us for that. Um, other than that, there's, of course, services next week, and our church's picnic, our annual picnic, has been scheduled for August 21st at Smiley's Park, August 21st, so mark off that Saturday, and Lord willing, we'll see everyone there, and if it rains that day, then the backup date is September the 4th, so August the 21st is the date for our picnic. Now let's take our Bibles and go to Acts chapter 13. Acts chapter 13 this evening. And when you find your spot in Acts chapter 13, we're going to be reading starting at near the end of the chapter at verse number 44. When you find your spot, let's stand together for the reading of God's word. So uh, by going the way to the valley, it's exit three or is it four? It's exit four on the way to the valley, but everyone will meet at the church. And if you need to drive, yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you. no problem. <laughs> Acts chapter 13, and um, starting at verse number 44. Uh -huh. 
And the next Sabbath day came almost the whole city together to hear the word of God. But when the Jews saw the multitudes, that they were filled with envy and spake against those things which were spoken by Paul, contradicting and blaspheming. Then Paul and Barnabas waxed bold and said, It was necessary that the word of God should first have been spoken to you, but seeing ye put it from you and judge yourselves unworthy of everlasting life, lo, we turn to the Gentiles. For so hath the Lord commanded us, saying, I have set thee to be a light of the Gentiles, that thou shouldest be for salvation unto the ends of the earth. And when the Gentiles heard this, they were glad and glorified the word of the Lord. And as many as were ordained to eternal life believed. And the word of the Lord was published throughout all the region. But the Jews stirred up the devout and honorable women and the chief men of the city and raised persecution against Paul and Barnabas and expelled them out of their coasts. But they shook off the dust of their feet against them and came unto Iconium. And the disciples were filled with joy and with the Holy Ghost. And then we'll also read the first seven verses of chapter 14. And it came to pass in Iconium that they went both together into the synagogue of the Jews, and so spake that a great multitude, both of the Jews and also of the Greeks, believed. But the unbelieving Jews stirred up the Gentiles and made their minds evil affected against the brethren. Long time, therefore, abode they, speaking boldly in the Lord, which gave testimony unto the word of his grace and granted signs and wonders to be done by their hands. But the multitude of the city was divided and part held with the Jews and part with the apostles. And when there was an assault made both of the Gentiles and also of the Jews with their rulers to use them despitefully and to stone them, they were aware of it and fled unto Lystra and Derbe, cities of Lyconia, and unto the region that lieth round about, and there they preach the gospel. This evening I'd like to consider the thought, the persecution never stopped. The persecution never stopped, and we'll see what we mean by that as we look at the word this evening. Our Father, I thank you for the time that we get to be gathered together with our Bibles and to uh, read the Bible and to be challenged from your word tonight. Lord, I just thank you, Lord, for um, this book in Acts that tells us of how the gospel was carried to the uttermost parts of the earth. And I pray, Lord, tonight as we consider Paul and Barnabas as they take this stand in, uh, in Antioch and Pisidia and then in uh, Iconium, I just th pray, Lord, that you'll help us, Lord, to see for ourselves um, what we have in Christ and why it's so important to just keep going, to keep pressing on, to keep spreading the gospel. And I pray, Lord, that we will be devoted to our wonderful Savior. I ask, Lord, that you'll fill me with the Spirit to preach your word tonight. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Please be seated. During the Battle of Gettysburg, the General told one of uh, the, the General Longstreet told one of his generals to, uh, to go advance his troops. But the general comes to him and he tells him, I'm unable to. <laughs> I can't, I can't advance my troops. I, I can't go any further. And the general said, well, that's fine then. The, the enemy will advance and they'll take care of that for you. <laughs> they, they will spare you the trouble, he said. Hey, listen, the enemy doesn't stop, does it? The enemy does not stop. The fact is, all throughout history, the, we have had an enemy that has not stopped. The persecution has never stopped. You think of the very beginning. Cain and Abel. Cain persecuted Abel. Ever since then, the, the, the wicked have persecuted the righteous. It has not stopped. And the persecution of the church, it didn't just start in our text in Acts chapter 13. The persecution that Paul faced didn't just start here. In fact, in Paul's life, you read the day he got saved. He goes to Damascus, and he's there in Damascus. He starts to preach the gospel there. And at that very start, the persecution gets so bad that they have to, that they're watching the gates for him, and they literally have to lower him down over the city wall in a basket 
so that he can run for his life. He knew full well what persecution meant. And his whole Christian life, the persecution never stopped. And uh, we could take the time this evening just to zero in on the persecution and depress ourselves and say, no, poor, poor us. The persecution just never stops, does it? I mean, it just keeps getting worse and worse day after day. We just, uh, when, when are we ever going to have it easy here as Christians? Why is it that we're always persecuted thus or whatever? But friend, let's just remember that, yes, there's going to be trials. There will be persecution. There will be opposition. But even still, we're on the winning side. We're on the winning side, and there, though we are persecuted, there are some things that persecution can never stop. And so tonight, rather than focusing on that enemy, let's remind ourselves of the victory that we have, that we see right here in this text. Because tonight, uh, we realize that the devil, just like then, the devil's the same today. He doesn't like the church today. We have an enemy in this world, the same enemy that Paul and Barnabas faced so many years, today, years ago. And like he did to Paul, he, he might be able to chase us out of certain places. He, he might be able to chase us out of our vocation. He might be able to make us hurt physically or financially. He might be able to wreak havoc on the church. This persecution doesn't stop. We will have trials and tribulations. But tonight, let's remember that we still have the victory. And let's remember some things that persecution can never stop. Let's look at the text and think, number one, this persecution that they faced, number one, it never stopped the salvation of the Gentiles. It never stopped the salvation of the Gentiles. Last week when we concluded our passage, we, we had a much different situation, didn't we? Paul and Barnabas had arrived in Antioch and Pisidia, and they went right to the synagogue. They sat down and they said, Brethren, Paul and Barnabas, do you have anything to say? And just like that, Paul and Barnabas were given the opportunity to preach. I almost asked Bill if he wanted to preach tonight, but I didn't, you know. I thought I'd give it easy to him. He's on vacation, you know. But uh, Paul and Barnabas, uh, brethren, would you have anything to say? And Paul took the opportunity and he preached the gospel. He preached the gospel onto them. And, uh, and that we saw how the, the people, yes, not all of them believed, there were, but there was a many that believed, the text said. Many believed. Many, many joined the church that day. Many got saved that day. And the Gentiles came to them and said, hey, can you tell us the same words next week? Next week, we'd like to hear the same thing. And so in chapter 13, at the beginning of our text tonight, it tells us in verse 44, and the next Sabbath day came almost the whole city together to hear the word of God. That's pretty exciting, isn't it? Imagine if almost the whole city of Halifax came together to hear the word of God. Came together. Getting together in general today is a wonderful idea. But, um, <laughs> but getting together today, what do men get together for? They get together to watch the hockey game or to watch the Olympics or to watch some, 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 some musician. Uh, they get together for all these different things. But imagine if they all got together for the Word of God. What, what a thrill that would be to be here in Halifax and to see that happen. And, you know, that's what this city needs. It, it needs the words of God. What a difference it would make in our city if our city came together like that to hear the words of God. And so you'd think that those there that day that claimed to know God, those there that day that claimed to have a relationship with him, that went to the synagogue every week, that came to hear the word of God read and hear it taught, you'd think that they would be thrilled with the idea, with, the, with seeing the whole city gathered together to hear the word of God. But as we begin the text, we realize that it was quite the different story. It says in verse 45, But when, when the Jews saw the multitudes, they were filled with envy and spake against those things which were spoken by Paul, contradicting and blaspheming. They didn't like it at all. The Bible says they were moved with envy. 
envy. They were, we use the word envy to describe jealousy today, but they, 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 they literally just didn't want them to have what they had. They had the scriptures. They had God to themselves, and they didn't want to share the Lord with the Gentiles. They didn't want to share their synagogue with them. They didn't want to share their worship with them. They had the idea that they were better than them, and they didn't want to see the Gentiles brought in all throughout the Jewish history. They, of course, were segregated. They were to be separated, to be different than the world, and only a few proselytes ever came into the faith. And now that they see that the Lord is ready to bring in the Gentiles, they were jealous of it. And rather than rejoicing, they spoke against the things spoken by Paul and Barnabas, contradicting and even blaspheming, even blaspheming the God who they profess to love. You see, they just didn't want others to get saved. And today, the, the devil's still the same. That's something he doesn't want. He doesn't want to see others get saved. He doesn't want to see a people come to know the Lord Jesus Christ as their Savior. He's still opposed to God's soul-saving ministry. He still moves in opposition to the work of God. He still stirs up the hearts of those outside the church and sometimes in the church to contradict and to blaspheme. He works through what the world considers the educated crowd. He works through what the world sees as the uneducated crowd. He has representatives in both circles. He works through the religious crowd. He works through the non-religious crowd. Anywhere and everywhere, he is on a mission to stop people from believing the gospel, to stop people from being saved. And so in the text, in order to stop it, he stirred up this persecution, the persecution of the church. But you know, there's one thing persecution can never stop. It can never stop the salvation of lost souls. The Bible tells us in verse 46 what Paul responded. He said, Then Paul and Barnabas waxed bold and said, It was necessary that the word of God should first have been spoken to you. Remember the gospels to the Jew first, but also to the Greek. But seeing ye put it from you, and judge yourselves unworthy of everlasting life, lo, we turn to the Gentiles. For so hath the Lord commanded us, saying, I have set thee to be a light of the Gentiles, that thou mayest, shouldest be for salvation unto the ends of the earth. That's Isaiah chapter 49, verse 6. The Lord Jesus, he is a light to the Gentiles. He is for salvation to the ends of the earth. Aren't you glad that the plan of salvation includes people like us? It includes you. It includes me. And the Gentiles hear Paul's rebuke, and they, they, re, they rejoice. They're glad when they hear it. They glorify the word of the Lord. And it says there in verse number 48, And as many as were ordained to eternal life believed. You say, oh boy, that's a verse that the Calvinist loves, doesn't he? <laughs> All right, what's well, the pastor doing even bringing up that verse tonight? Well, he goes through about the passage of Scripture, and we come to a verse, we come to a verse. <laughs> There's no picking and choosing there. But God says there, it says that whosoever was ordained, as many as were ordained to eternal life, believed. And remember, though, when God speaks of ordaining, when he talks about predestination, it's always predicated by his foreknowledge. And God tells us over and over again that he doesn't make the decision for us. It's open to whosoever will. But in this passage, I believe God is simply making a, a statement, making a point here to tell us that this persecution that they faced, it had no influence on the results. It had no influence. The Jews' opposition had no influence on whether or not people got saved. They tried what they could. They tried to resist the words to argue with Paul. They seemed to feel that they were influencing people's decisions, that they were stopping them from entering the family of faith. But they had no sway. They had no power here. The ones who were ordained to eternal life ones who were to be saved by God's grace through faith, they still believed. There was no power of hell, no scheme of man. Nothing was going to stop them from putting their faith and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. The persecution was powerless to stop the salvation of the Gentiles. 
It couldn't stop it from happening. This statement is very much parallel to the Old Testament selection of the Jews, you know. Jacob was elected. God chose him. He chose the nation of Israel. It was a sovereign choice of God. The persecution of the Gentiles couldn't stop God's selection of Jacob, of Israel. It couldn't break his promise to him. And now in the New Testament, God is electing to open the door of faith to the Gentiles. God is electing to save the, the, the nations by grace through faith. And now it's the house of Jacob that's opposing. It's the Jews who are opposing his work, who are standing in the way and saying, no, they can't be blessed. Except it's God who blesses and who is man to oppose. They're powerless to stop the salvation of the Gentiles. When God elects to save, who is man to oppose? And while persecution might stop your income, it might stop some comforts in life, it's always powerless to stop the salvation of souls. The persecution never stopped the salvation of lost souls. And then number two this evening, consider this about the persecution. It never stopped the spirit of gladness. It never stopped the spirit of gladness. As the text goes on, we see that the word of the Lord then, verse 49, was published throughout all the region. So now it's not just the city, Antioch, there in Pisidia, that hears the gospel. It's all that region that hears the gospel. And that, of course, is a wonderful thing. We'd be excited about that today, to hear the gospel going all throughout the coasts of Nova Scotia like that. But... Uh, the Jews, of course, didn't like it. And the persecution only gets worse. It says in verse 50, they stirred up the devout and honorable women and the chief men of the city and raised persecution against Paul and Barnabas and expelled them out of their coasts. They kicked them out. They forced them out. They, they said, you're not welcome here, Mr. Missionary. You're not welcome here to preach the gospel, to tell these people about the Lord Jesus Christ. But verse 51 and 52 tell us, but they shook off the dust of their feet against them and came unto Iconium. And the disciples, notice this, the disciples were filled with joy and with the Holy Ghost. Filled with joy. Think of that. They're just kicked out of the city. They, uh, they've been expelled out of their coasts. They, they were greatly persecuted, treated as the of scouring of society. But that couldn't take away their joy. They were still filled with joy and the Holy Ghost. That's how Jesus tells us to react, you know, with persecution. In Matthew chapter 5, blessed are you, Matthew chapter 5, verse 12, rejoice, or verse 11 and 12, blessed are ye when men shall revile you and persecute you and shall say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceeding glad, for great is your reward in heaven, for so persecuted they the prophets which were before you. Rejoice. They're persecuted, and they're still filled with joy and with the Holy Ghost. You know, it's important there to realize that those two there go hand in hand. They were filled with joy because they were filled with the Holy Ghost. The Holy Ghost, that's one of the fruits of the Spirit. The fruit of the Spirit is love, and the second one on the list is joy. Love, joy, and then peace. A love, a joy is one of the fruit of the Spirit. So that's why I'm calling this the spirit of gladness. They could persecute them. They could kick them out of the city, but they couldn't take away their joy because their joy was in, found in the Spirit of God. You see, so often, you know what makes what our joy is founded on? It's founded on our outward circumstances. That's, that's what makes us happy. Uh, like, for instance, the, the Montreal Canadiens making it all the way to the Stanley Cup Finals. That made me pretty happy up until about game one against the Tampa Bay Lightning. <laughs> and then I'm watching the game, and Bethany's trying to talk to me. And when things don't go well, it's a dangerous thing to talk to me. <laughs> you might not get the reaction that you hope for when, uh, when you're talking to me and my team is losing, you know. <laughs> not quite as happy then. But uh, 
Then when they won that one game, I was happy that night. That was a, she, she was able to talk to me that night. But you know, our, that's how we often are. That's just a, you know, m many people are like that, actually. But um, we often are affected by what's going on around us. Uh, for instance, if we, were, if we were in Paul and Barnabas' situation, people didn't like us. That wouldn't make us very happy. We, we like to be liked. We like to be treated nicely. And when we're getting, being treated nicely and have good relationships and everybody likes us, then that makes us happy. That gives us some, some joy. And then someone said something behind my back or somebody said something right to my face. You hear maybe a, that somebody doesn't like you the way you thought. And all of a sudden, just like that. I mean, everyone else can love you, but one person just said something that you didn't like or something negative about you. And next thing you know, your joy's gone, just like that. Just like that, that's all you can think about. What about all these other good things? No, it's just that one negative thing. That's, that's what I'm gonna think about. That's gonna steal my joy. And our problem is that our joy is fit, fixed on our circumstances. It's fixed on eternal factors. But for Christians, we need to learn that that's not our source of joy. Because eternal, external factors, they, they change. What, the circumstances, they change. Uh, there's going to be good days. There's going to be bad days. There, there's going to be good times and low times. There's going to be all these, different, uh, uh, all these different factors day by day that vary. But you know what doesn't change? The Lord Jesus Christ, he doesn't change. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. And the Bible tells us not to rejoice in your circumstances, not to rejoice in your hockey team making the Stanley Cup finals, not to rejoice in the things of earth, but rejoice in the Lord. Rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. Yes, they might, things might not go your way being a Christian. It might be that as you take a stand for Christ that uh, the world might, 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 Kick you out of some places. Say you're not welcome here. Maybe so. But they can't take away your joy. Because our joy is founded in the Lord. There is a missionary that returned to a little village which had been destroyed by the enemies of the gospel. And he found the people weeping over the ashes which were previously their thatched roofs. And one of the natives said to him, They even burned my Bible and my hymn book. And then in the ruins, he saw a little white paper, not totally burned. He picked it up and read it. It was from the hymn book, and it was a song, Joy to the World, the Lord has come. He stopped for a moment. He said, that's enough for me. Lost all the things, but there are some things that the world can't take away. It can't take away our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. And if he's the source of your joy, then it can't take away your joy. The persecution never stopped. It never stopped the salvation of the Gentiles. And it never stopped the spirit of gladness. And number three, the persecution never stopped the signs of grace. Never stopped the signs of grace. Chapter 14 begins their ministry in Iconium. It came to pass that they went both together into the synagogue of the Jews and so spake that a great multitude both of the Jews and also of the Greeks believed. Think of that. Here they go again. Every time they're persecuted, they go somewhere else. They preach the gospel again, and the Lord works again. They saw it in Antioch and Pisidia. Then they saw it in uh, the region roundabout. Now they're in Iconium, and the same thing is happening. They're preaching the gospel, and a great many of Jews and Greeks are believing. But now we once again have the same story. Once again, in verse 2, the unbelieving Jews stirred up the Gentiles and made their mind, minds evil affected against the brethren. Once again, they're in the same position. Once again, they're facing the same persecution. And once again, they keep going. Verse 3, we see that the persecution never stopped the signs of grace. It says, Long time, therefore, abode they speaking boldly in the Lord, which gave testimony unto the word of his grace, and granted signs and wonders to be done by their hands. The Lord gave testimony unto the word of his grace with signs and wonders 
being done by their hands. I call it here the signs of grace, the Spirit of God working through the apostles. And I understand, we all understand here this evening that uh, the sign gifts were given to confirm the Word of God, and they aren't evident in the churches today. But the fact is, God is still working. He is still proving himself to men, and no amount of opposition can stop that. Uh, God, God hasn't, you know, as Elijah made fun of Baal, said perhaps he's uh, on vacation, maybe he's taking a trip, perhaps he sleeps and you have to call a little louder and wake him up. Uh, perhaps, perhaps that's going on with Baal. Listen, that's not anything that ever happens with God. <laughs> he's not asleep. He, he, he's not dead. He's not on vacation. He's still active in the world today. He's still active in the church. And we can still see his hand working among us. Uh, you know, we, we don't have the sign gifts today, but we still have answered prayer, don't we? Don't we take things to the Lord in prayer? And don't we see the Lord working? Don't we see him showing us those little signs of grace, little tokens of his grace in the prayers that he answers? My wife was telling me a story just the other day that she had just read of a missionary to Zaire who told the story of a, a mother at the mission station who had died after giving birth to a premature baby. And they tried to improvise an incubator to keep the infant alive, but the only hot water bottle they had was beyond despair. And so they asked for, a, for the children to pray for the baby and for her sister. And one of the girls responded and said, Dear God, please send a hot water bottle today. Tomorrow will be too late because by then the baby will be dead. And dear Lord, send a doll for the sister so she won't feel so lonely. Well, that afternoon, a large package arrived from England. And uh, the children watched as it was opened. And much to their surprise, under some clothing was a hot water bottle. And immediately the little girl who had prayed so earnestly started to dig deeper and said, if God sent that, I'm sure he'll also send a doll. And she kept digging, she kept digging, and she was right. Down in the bottom of the box, she found a doll for the little girl. Hey, five months earlier, it would have been back then. He had this la the lady had, ladies group had sent this package that had those specific things that they needed just that day. You know what that is? That's a sign of grace. That's a token of the grace of God. That's God sending another reminder that he's still working, that he still answers prayer. Yes, there's persecution, but the Lord still gives testimony through signs and wonders, through answered prayer, through working in our hearts and lives. He hasn't stopped working yet. The persecution can't stop the signs of grace. Then one more thing this evening. Never stop the salvation of the Gentiles or the spirit of gladness or the signs of grace. And then one more thing, it never stopped the spreading of the gospel. Verse four, once again, the persecution comes, but the multitude of the city was divided, part held with the Jews, part with the Gentiles. And when there was an assault made both of the Gentiles and also of the Jews with their rulers to use them despitefully and to stone them, they were aware of it and fled unto Lystra and Derby, cities of Lyconia, and unto the region that lieth round about. And notice this, and there they preached the gospel. There they preached the gospel. It, it just keeps happening. Persecution isn't stopping for Paul, isn't it? Everywhere they go, they're facing it. Everywhere they go, they're facing this opposition. And you know what the point of the, what the persecutor's goal is, don't you? It's to get them to stop. They don't want the gospel going any further. They don't want the spreading of it. They don't want this word to spread any further than what it's gone. They want to put a stop to it right now. But every time they persecute, it just goes further and further. They persecuted, and now they've, they went from Antioch in Pisidia. From there, they went to Iconium. They got all the regions round about there. From there, they went to, uh, and from there, they're going to Lystra and Derby, all because of the persecution that they faced. They thought that this would do it. They thought that they could stop them in their tracks, that the gospel would go no further. 
They won't be telling anybody else about the Savior. This will be the end. But the more they persecuted, the more it spread. They took the gospel to the next region and once again preached the name of Jesus. Don't you know that the devil is powerless to stop the spread of the gospel? He's powerless. He, can't oppose, he can oppose it. He can withstand it. He can persecute the church, but he can't stop it. Jesus said, I will build my church. And he said, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And what he's saying there is the church is going to be marching forward. I'm building my church. And hell is not going to stop it. The devil is not going to be able to stop it from happening. He's not going to be able to stop the church from being built, the church from advancing. It'll be powerless to stop the spread of the gospel. You know, so often Paul faced persecution. Uh, I think of Paul, I think we all think of Paul as the greatest missionary of all time. That's how I think of the Apostle Paul, the greatest missionary of all time. And Paul faced great persecution. I can just imagine the devil and what he was thinking. I got to stop that Paul. I got to get my hands on him. If I can just get that Paul in prison, then I can stop this whole thing. I just got to get that Paul. And so he gets Paul in Acts chapter 21 in Jerusalem. He gets him thrown into prison and they, um, they take him to Caesarea. From there, they take him to Rome. And the devil's thinking, finally, this is going to be the end. There's going to be nothing more of the spreading of the gospel because I got Paul locked down. Except he made two mistakes. First of all, he may be bound Paul, but as Paul tells us, the word of God was not bound. And even the things he did to Paul didn't stop the spreading of the gospel. In the book of Philippians, Paul is writing to the church in Philippi a thank you letter for the help that they sent him while he was in prison. And you can imagine the church in Philippi hearing about Paul's imprisonment and being concerned, thinking, thinking, uh, you know, poor Paul, and what's going to happen now? And I just feel so bad for me. He can't do anything now. Nobody's getting saved through Paul. And, Paul says, I don't want you to think the worst about this. Listen, Philippians 1.12, I would ye should understand, brethren, that the things which happened unto me have fallen out rather unto the furtherance of the gospel. Yes, I'm in prison, but guess what? It's only spreading all the more. <laughs> it's, only, it's only getting out that much more. He says now uh, people are talking everywhere about the Lord Jesus Christ. Some people, yeah, some people are preaching Christ of envy and strife, but some are, so some are preaching it. Uh, some are just more bold to speak, speak without fear. Some are supposing to add affliction to my bonds, but some are speaking it out of love, knowing that I am set for the defense of the gospel. What then, notwithstanding in every way, whether in pretense or truth, Christ is preached, and I therein do rejoice, yea, and will rejoice. The persecution, the imprisonment of Paul couldn't stop the spread of the gospel. The word of God wasn't bound. Souls were still being saved. And friends, souls are still being saved today. There's lots going on. We, we've had a hard year. We've had a pandemic year where... Uh, we've struggled to be able to meet together, struggled to be able to go out and, and speak to people about the Savior. And we've had all these obstacles in our way. But guess what? Souls have still gotten saved in 2021. Souls, the gospel has still been spread. Uh, the devil would love to shut us down. He'd love to close us up to put an end to the gospel. He's always opposed the church, but he can't stop it. He's powerless to stop it. He can't stop the salvation of a soul. He can't stop the spirit of gladness. He can't stop the signs of grace. And he can't stop the spread of the gospel. And so, though it hasn't been easy, you can always keep going. Because guess what? You're on the winning side. You, you can read Revelation chapter 20, 21, and 22 and know how it all ends. You know that you're on the, that you're on the, that God if God be for us, who can be against us? And so by his grace, you can keep going just like Paul and keep spreading the gospel. Let's pray. Our Father, I thank you, Lord, for the text that was before us this evening. Lord, I just thank you, Lord, for um, the Apostle Paul's witness and how him and Barnabas were 
so bold to go to all these places and just keep on preaching, regardless of whether or not it was popular, regardless of the persecution they faced, they just kept on preaching the gospel. And I pray this evening, Lord, that you'll give us the same zeal to tell people the gospel, regardless of the outcome, regardless of whether or not to, it's a popular thing to do. I pray that we'll do it, Lord, so that we can see the gospel spread throughout our city and throughout our country. And I pray in Jesus' name, amen.